Okay, Sophia says, given the book you recommend, Culture of Make-Believe, what might you say to merge the knowing with marketing? So Sophia, where are you? Where are you from? St. Louis. St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Okay, well, welcome. Good to have you here. Um, so let me see if I understand the question. Is, is the wondering, you know, we have somebody like Derek Jensen, who's written, you know, such a book and uh, critiquing the very basis of Western civilization and civilization as a whole. And then we have marketing. And how do I reconcile those two? Is that the question? I've been so impacted by this book. Oh, yeah. And um, I, it's, there's some part of my nervous system that wants to be connected into how does this translate? Well, how do I change my, it wants, almost wants my work to change because of it. There's, it's like, there's this marketing for hippies and then there's this book. Sure, totally. And they, and they wanna come together from in my consciousness. It's so important. And it seems to me that it would structure itself in a, a new way as I integrate and incorporate it into my work. Well, I mean, first of all, just for me to be mentioned in the same sentence as Derek Jensen, I can die happy. This is a, a highlight of my month. Second, yeah, he's a brilliant author. Boy, DerekJensen.org, D-E-R-R-I-C-K-J-E-N-S-E-N.org. I cannot recommend his work highly enough. Uh, if you have not read his books, I mean, his book, uh, Language Older Than Words, just both ruined and consoled and clarified me in a way that uh, almost no other book had before or has since. And yeah, Culture of Make-Believe, my God, what a tome of, uh, of uh, beauty and, and, uh, and hardness. So, and it, hey, if you just want to read a good author and just good writing, some of the best writing I've ever come across too. So, but, so let me broaden this a little more than just about Derek Jensen, because we all have to reconcile these things, yeah? We've got this, we're, we're living in mainstream society, which is the rough beast that it is. And then we have these maybe mystical, anarchistic, um, pagan, indigenous, you know, sides. And we're trying to, how do we reconcile these things? How do we bring them together? How do we, how do we um, make sense of this? So the very first thing I'd say is, you probably are gonna come up with your own synthesis that I can't imagine. And so most of this is just entrusted to you. You know, the book has impacted you the way it's impacted you. And my work has uh, done what it's done with you. And so it's gonna be up to you to figure out how do you bring them together. And you're probably gonna come up with something I couldn't and bless you. So all I can say is for me, uh, how it's been, it may, may not be the same for you. Um, this is one of the things that can make our work so unique. Yeah, is we're bringing things together that don't normally fit together. Marketing and hippies, what? <laughs> you know, it made no sense that those two things, and, and there's, a, there's actually a, a blog post I wrote uh, marketingforhippies.com slash oxymoronic is the, uh, so if somebody maybe can find it or pull it up and put it in the chat, uh, marketingforhippies.com slash oxymoronic. And it's this idea of business names that are oxymorons, things that normally don't go together that seem to be inconsistent with each other, how to fit them together. That's it. I can't plug in my computer. I don't want it to die while I'm talking. Um, So just to say that it's interesting, it makes our business more interesting. These oxymoronic business names, oh man, they're so attention getting. Chocolateforbreakfast.com, what a URL. Who would have thought chocolate and breakfast in the same sentence? Who is this genius, you know? And there's, anyways, there's a bunch more examples in it and you'll see. So they're not the enemies of each other. There's some unlikely kinship that these things can have. And here's what it's been for me with Derek Jensen's work uh, and, and the broader things he speaks about. Uh, 
I'm, well, I'm going to be speaking very broadly here, so please forgive any any generalizations I make that are unbecoming. But I think for most of our ancestors, that understanding of kinship with the natural world, yeah, and being in relationship with everyone in creation, it was is very central. The understanding of everything in the world, not as things but as persons. Wendell Berry's line that the universe is not, uh, I think it was Wendell Berry. Maybe it was, anyways. Was he? he said, the universe is not a collection of objects. It's a communion of subjects. I think that understanding is very old for humanity. The deer people, the ant people, the water, you know, all of these are living ones. And so relationship and kinship is so important, but also for all of our ancestors, food has been central. Everything is about food. This is even so much of the nature of relationships in the world. I mean, maybe in the spirit world, a different arrangement, but in this world, uh, today you're food for me, and tomorrow I'm food for you. If everything's working, that we sustain and feed each other. And that, uh, of course, it's important to be human that you get food. You got to get fed. And it's just being alive, uh, we need food. So let's just imagine we have these two cornerstones or foundation stones. One of them, food, sustenance. And the other one, relationship, goodwill. That these are two very human cornerstones. And that if you miss one of those, if one of those is not in place, the whole thing goes out of balance. If you have a lot of goodwill and relationship, but no food, you die. I mean, just <laughs> practically speaking, this doesn't pan out well. You know, translation, this is a bunch of hippies starting a commune, and we're just going to live off the land, but they've never lived off the land before. Oh, there's lots of goodwill and free love, but there's no free food. <laughs> so they... You know, it doesn't work and the whole thing collapses. But on the other side, if you have food and sustenance, but not goodwill, well, hey, welcome to a lot of modern society too. Isn't this what we've become? Food for a bunch of people, no food for other people, too much food for other people. Most of the food not making us healthy and the food raised in such a way that doesn't honor the kinship and relationships. I mean, factory farms are just such, whether you're vegan or a meat eater, everybody can agree. Factory farms are an abomination because there's no tending to the relationship with those creatures. Okay, so we have those two foundation stones. Well, in a, I think traditional society, those two are so woven together and no money exchanged in any of it, is there? It's just a gift economy for most of our our, uh, our own ancestries, and in some places of the world still, gift economy. Now that started to break down. Empires emerge, things are domesticated, yeah, plants and animals. And uh, for those of you who know the story of Iron John, what's that a story of? It's a story of the domestication of iron. Who is Iron John? Oh, well, that's Iron himself, yeah. So when that happens and then empires emerge and civilizations build, well, the scale of transactions and relationships is suddenly so huge. Instead of the 150 people you might have in the tribe, it's so big. So now we have to keep track. So what's some of the earliest writing of humans? It's on these tablets that they find in Sumer. And what is it? It's accounting of all things. It's accounting. It's keep, keeping track of these transactions that have now gone to this scale. And so money comes in. And of course, money has now evolved to the Federal Reserve and interest charge on money. And soon, soon, you know it's coming. Digital currencies. I mean, the insanity of the abstraction of all this is, is madness. So here we are. And so, okay, let's just pause that. Tesco, Safeway, Savon, uh, the co-op, you know, the, the grocery store, the big chain stores. They did a study and they found that 
there were 10 times less conversations at a mainstream grocery store than at a farmer's market. Yeah. Or at a craft show. When you go to those things, that's the market, isn't it? The farmer's market. It's a craft market. And so what is the market? Well, the market, I think traditionally speaking, that was one of the places that we met. Now kinship had already been sort of fractured a bit, but we would come together in the market to, to see each other. And it was a way of saying, here's what I've been up to since I saw you last. I've grown these oranges. I made this pottery. And this was a way we could reconnect with each other and share and trade and barter and pay with money if that's where it was. So all of this to say this, you know those old stone archways, you know, and you got the two pillars of stones on the side and then it comes together. And there's the keystone that locks it together. This is my submission. The market is the keystone. Yeah, marketing is the market in action. It's the market making the delicious noise it makes that you hear at a farmer's market. The market is where goodwill and sustenance come together. It's the meeting place, the one of them in the modern world, or it could be again, depending on how we proceed. But if the way that we market so poisons the well of goodwill, no chance. And that's of course what's happening now, all the sketchy marketing tactics. The fundamental thing is food gets prioritized over relationship. And it's no good, it's no good. But then of course the hippies prioritize the relationship over food, and but the market is where they meet. And where they meet, it's the market right now. That they meet at all is our immense good fortune. Isn't it incredible? We don't have to choose between ethics and effectiveness. Ethics, goodwill and relationship, effectiveness, sustenance and food. We don't have to choose between them. This is the whole basis of my work, that we can relate to each other in a beautiful way. We can share our work in a beautiful way. And in so doing, we start to reconstitute that archway. Yeah. And preserve something of the old world. I think most of us would prefer to, to have, do this all without money. Most of us can see the gross complications and atrocities of the global economic system and the banking system that we could go on and on. So, I mean, just amen to all of that. And anyone who wrestles with this and wonders, I just, mwah, thank you. Uh, and here we are. And so to me, we just keep coming back to those foundation stones. And can we create a place where we meet? Can we make every meeting we have with the client be that, the meeting place, of this, of saying, hey, here I am, I'm a human, and I need to eat, and you need help, and I'm needy, and you're needy too. We're just not uh, divinely self-sustained. And maybe that's true in the spirit world in a different arrangement, but here it seems to be that I need to eat and you need help, and can we come up with some arrangement that's gonna feel good on both sides, where both of us get fed the thing that we're most needing to be fed right now. And, if we can do it in this way, you know, part of, you don't get empire and civilization without coercion. Coercion is right at the root of it all. And this starts all the way back, you know, with armies, with the, the Holy Roman Empire in Europe, you know, the, the, the church, and then it becomes science, and there's always some new coercion. But to fit in to the mainstream, you, you there's so much coercion there that fundamentally, I submit, did not exist in that way in traditional cultures. The immense respect for the individual was so high because it was also held, housed in this village-mindedness and togetherness, and they had the relationship, and still do, of course, the ones that are still cooking, this relationship between the individual and the collective. They had it right, right on point and struggled, as, as all humans do with it. But in the place of that living brood culture of aliveness and kinship and the balance of the individual and the collective, we get this crazy insane coercion. And that's in our education system, it's in our employment, 
it's in relationships, it's in romance, it's everywhere. And my God, it is certainly in marketing and perhaps mostly so as most modern marketing came from studies of Edward Bernays on propaganda. You know, it's a very sick old relationship with uh, or new relationship, this whole propaganda and coerce, coer coercing people. And so we think we have to do that in order to succeed. And I say, no, 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 we don't. No coercion is required. Uh, in the short term, coercion works. In the long term, it's a disaster. But the greatest disaster, it's not just that our business suffers, because it will long term if this is the stuff we do. And you can't sleep at night, so there's that. It's not just that, but it's, it's, um, it poisons the well of village mindedness. And there's not much of that left. But if we do it the other way, we can start to uh, deeply affirm the uh, divinity of people, the sacredness of people, simply by not coercing them. Because most people are expecting coercion at every turn. It's become so normalized. So when somebody says, ah, I, I see you're in a vulnerable spot here. Um, well, here's what I have to offer. You, you think about it. You let me know. No pressure at all. And we back off instead of leaning on. This does something to people. This wakens up some sort of uh, older knowing of how it is to be human, to be that respected. I mean, I do think across the board in indigenous cultures, respect is a big deal. So when we treat people in this way, we're starting to feed that old spirit, it seems to me. And this is not the only work. Of course, this is us putting food on the table and trying to do it in as beautiful way as we can. And there's other work that's needed. And so God bless all of you who are doing community work, activism, you know, creating alternatives in your community. There's all that too. What we're talking about here is one very small piece of the picture in the puzzle. And there's much more, but certainly it starts with a, a, a very sober look at how things are in the world. And I can't, there's very few people I could recommend more highly than Derek Jensen and his work in terms of, if you just want a real, wake up cult, how it is, and how did it come to be this way? My God, he's got about 20 books right now, and I've read probably half of them. So uh, there you go. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Sophia, any, any thoughts or reflections, or did I miss the point completely? Oh, you got the point beautifully. <laughs> Thank you. I, and you made the link that I needed today. And I'm curious if there's anybody on the call that's read his work or wants to, I'd love to be talking with other people in your community about it. Yeah, certainly. Well, um, if you have hit the reactions button, raise your hand. Anybody? Oh man, a bunch of folks who get to discover Derek Jensen. I envy you, but I also don't envy you. <laughs> his work is so devastating. Uh, yeah, he's got a bunch of books. The one I started with was a language older than words. And it's just one of the most heartbreaking and beautiful things I've ever read. And so beautifully written. So yeah, that's my shameless plug for, for Derek. And I think we'll, we'll leave it there. I don't think I'm going to be able to hit those heights in my answers to another uh, question. But thank you for coming. Thank you for being out there. Uh, maybe we'll see you in a membership, maybe in a program, and maybe not. But you know, hey, if I see you again, the world's amazing. I don't see you again. The world's still amazing. I'm glad you're out there. See you around.